the plenary that we're going to have now um, is really focused on building this idea of solutions and hope. And uh, we have David Johnson here with us from New Mexico, and he's a molecular biologist at the University of New Mexico, Las Cruces. And I had the great honor of meeting David in Hawaii last year because um, Center for Food Safety does have a small office in Hawaii and was approached by farmers and ranchers um, in the islands and asked to please bring some people together to talk about soil health. So we brought David to speak to these ranchers and m many of them were conventional. Um, and by the end of the weekend, he had totally convinced them that this was the way to make their systems more resilient and more profitable. And as a result, because Hawaii's a pretty small uh, island state and very nimble, um, working with our policy team, we were able to introduce policy to start a carbon farming task force that is now up and running in Hawaii. So that's the power of David Johnson, ladies and gentlemen. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. You change something by building a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. What I hope to convey to you here today is, okay, what I hope to convey to you today is a, the potential ability to fulfill this. This is another tool in the toolbox that will help us get to the root of the matter. First of all, you have to look at the system that you're dealing with. This is what we see on planet Earth today. There are ladders of succession for all of the different ecosystems, moving from down here from bare soil parent material to your conifers and your old growth forest. What you see as you progress through there is an increase in net primary productivity. You also see a change from a bacterial dominant to a fungal dominant soil. This is where we are in agriculture today. What we grow well are weeds. This is where we need to be. Now what we have to realize about agriculture is it's controlled disturbance, not controlled demolition. So how do we get here? What we're trying to do is mimic what's happening in the rangeland soils, as Ray was talking about, bringing in the cattle, and what they do to this system is they start to improve the fertility, but they improve it by changing the, the structure of the microbes in the soil from a bacterial dominant to a fungal dominant soil. So we have to mimic that process in agriculture. This all came out of research that I was doing with USDA about find a way to make dairy waste a good product. Everybody that had tried it before ended up with a very saline product and it was bad, they concluded that it was bad for soils. My wife and I developed a composting process, a static composting process that used worms, vermicomposting, that gave a very fungal dominant compost. It also reduced water usage in the composting process by six times, reduced composting time by about 66%, and it also reduced the salinity in that dairy manure. This is the first week analysis of the, the bacteria in that system. As you can see, the top 80% only had about 23 species. There's not a lot of diversity in this, and there's a lot of high percentage population bacteria. This is at week four. Again, the top 80% only had about 23 species. This is week 22, and people say compost is ready to use. So you can see, still only 57 species in the top 87%. This is 60 weeks. You can see, you now have 99 species of bacteria in this. You've increased the diversity of this system, and you've also smoothed out uh, the population structure. I use this compost in a test to look at the different soil conditions that we see in agriculture. From, oops, from a bacterial dominant, low carbon soils, that's what we're dealing with in agriculture today, up to a fungal dominant, high carbon soil, 
uh, which is the goal that we're looking for. When you look at the efficiency of carbon flow through these different uh, soil conditions, you see in a bacterial dominant soil, only 3% of the carbon that you've captured actually goes into the plant structure. As you move up, fungal to bacterial ratio 0.84, you get 17%. Fungal to bacterial ratio 1.6, 21%. That fungal to bacterial ratio 2.3, you have 30%. Up to 37 on the next, and 56% in a fungal dominant fertile soil. This is where we are in our conventional agricultural system. We run at about 10% efficiency. We have the ability to quintuple that. So does this work in the real world? First of all, just a little primer on uh, the net primary production that most of the systems on this plant put out. In the best case scenario, a tropical rainforest does about 2,200 grams of dry biomass per square meter. Cultivated land, 600%. We water it, we irrigate it, we weed it, and still we're only netting about 600 grams of dry biomass. What I'm promoting is a biologically enhanced agricultural management, where we start to put the microbes back into this system and let them function, because microbes are the backbone of every organism and every ecosystem on this planet. In advanced beam, we've been practicing it for, for two or th for four or five years, I'm seeing up to 3,000 grams of dry biomass per square meter production. To do this in the real world, I do inoculations with the compost. This is what I started out with. This is 400 pounds per acre compost uh, application to kind of give you a visual of how little it takes to do this. This is a desert sandy soil test that I did. Uh, one application of compost the first year, growing cover crops, cutting them, hauling them off, growing again, cutting, hauling them off. This, the first year we did about 800 grams of dry biomass per square meter. This is the second year, 1,608. We doubled the production in that second year. This is the third year, 2,190 grams of dry biomass. Now, Consider this is a winter cover crop. Sorry to use the word cover crop, Ray. <laughs> you can see we're doing as much net primary productivity as the most productive ecosystem in the world in 10 weeks of growth. You plant this in about November, but it doesn't start really growing until mid-February, and this would be at the end of uh, April. So that much production with the right biology can make a big difference in our agroecosystems today. This is what it looked like over the three years. 820 on the treated, 1506, 2191, and 2244 in this last year. The system itself, the treated was doing 3,000 grams or above of dry biomass per square meter per year. A control with no treatment, you can see, was doing about 2,200. If you extend the trend lines on those, for the control to catch up with the treated, it's about a 30-year window. So biology does make a difference in this. This is looking at the soil in that system, comparing what I started with in the desert soil to the control treatment where we just planted cover crops and hauled them off to one that we treated with biology. You can see the diversity from that one treatment changes the whole way the system works. So we see significant increases in net primary production. Did this in another field at a university research site. Had one year of beam application, a control here. We had five times increase in the net primary productivity in one year. This is year six, 881 grams of dry biomass per square meter on that field, capturing 264 pounds of nitrogen just in the above ground biomass. This is uh, the summer cover crop. It's uh, sunflower, sesbania, uh, another couple of millets in it. And at June 23rd, it was about four inches high. 29 days later, it was six foot high. 
17 days later, it was over seven foot high. Now consider, this is a black oil seed sunflower. It's only supposed to grow about four to five feet tall. The heads are only supposed to be about six inches. So you can see the heads, some of them were bigger than mine. So we don't know what these plants can do when they are grown in the right condition. On the left-hand side is Cespania. The first season we grew it, it was four feet tall. The second season we grew it, it was six feet tall. And then this last season, it was 12 foot tall. So again, these plants act different with the right biology in the soil. This is this year's cover crop out there, 1,141 grams of dry biomass per square meter. Now realize we've gone from 50 to 1,141 grams in six years. So the dynamics change as the biology changes. This system also increases micronutrient availability, which a lot of the problem we have in our foods today is nutrient density. We do not have all the elements in there that we need for our survival on this planet. In the first 20 months of applying beam, I did five sampling periods. We saw, oops, we saw increases of over 1,100% on both manganese and iron as far as soluble elements that were available to the plant. We saw changes in magnesium, calcium, zinc, and copper from 83% to 40. We saw net macronutrient increases from 107% to 37% for MP and K. Now realize we use no fertilizers. I've used no fertilizers on this for the past seven years. And yet the biology starts to bring these new micronutrients and macronutrients back to availability. It increases water storage also. The first 1% increase in soil carbon quintuples the water that you have to work with in that system. That allows that water to stay around longer so you can use it more efficiently for photosynthesis, for all the processes that go on in the soil. We have nothing to lose by increasing carbon in the soil. It also increases soil carbon use of efficiency. This is kind of important because most scientists are saying if we increase carbon in the soil, we're just going to increase respiration. And to a certain point, they're true. This is true. But when you take a little deeper look at it, as you change your fungal bacterial ratio and increase your fertility in that system, now there's a hundred times increase in the biological biomass in this range of soils. And yet, we have an 18 times increase in the beginning soil carbon mass but only a four times increase in the soil carbon respiration. So what we've done, changing the biology changes the carbon use efficiency in the system. You look at this a little different way at your relative soil respiration relative to this amount of carbon that you had in that soil to start with. In a bacterial dominant, low carbon soil, 44% of that carbon is respired. As you increase the fertility, only 11% of the original carbon in that soil is respired. And that's how we're able to store more carbon, and that's how we'll reduce atmospheric CO2 concentrations by using agroecosystems. Increases carbon capture in the soils through the, both growing more biomass and improving carbon use efficiency. And this is what we've observed over the last four and a half years. An increase of 10.7 metric tons of carbon per hectare a year that we put into the soils or a quarter of a percent increase in the soil carbon each year in the top foot. When you compare this to other studies, West has 67 long-term no-till studies. 0.57 is what he's seen as potential increase as far as getting carbon into the soil. And this is tons of carbon per hectare per year. Nigley, 0.2. Lal is 0.7. The first four and a half years, I've averaged 10.7 tons carbon per hectare per year. I see the potential at 19.2. When you look at these systems for capturing carbon, if we do this scenario, it would take 40% of the arable land area on this planet to capture all anthropogenic CO2. If you, <laughs> if you go into an improved system, I see the potential for 19.2 tons. That would require 25% of the arable land on this planet. 
Now, I felt a little fringe for a while until Gabe. I finally got his data and I put it uh, on the chart. And he's doing a half percent. Back here, oops. I, I'm projecting half a percent potential. Gabe's doing it. So, and the change that happened on this is when he hit 3% soil organic matter, his carbon is important in this equation. When he stopped using nitrogen fertilizers, that's when this system took off. So we're also improving crop yields in this. This is a cotton crop that we do one and a half years beam compared to 150 pounds of nitrogen conventional. We've been able to increase the production in cotton and chili in uh, small trials, 114% for cotton, 98% for chili. This is my cotton crop this year. Uh, that was July 17th, two weeks later. Four weeks later. This is what we call high cotton. <laughs> and if you're picking cotton, that's the cotton you want to pick it in, because you don't have to bend over. <laughs> but the bowl formation on there is pretty significant. It's maturing very good. I'll have to see what the crop is, but we did five bales on that other treatment before. So we can meet these challenges. We can produce more food, reclaim, reclaim the degraded soils, and increase land area. We can use less water by increasing both plant water use efficiency and soil water hold capacity. We can reduce energy use by allowing nature to extract or fix the essential nutrients, and we reduce both agrochemical pollution and atmospheric CO2 concentrations at the same time. Why should we pursue this? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>